Okay, good morning everyone. Today we're going to discuss the nervous system senses. We're going to talk about each of the senses that is in our human body. So what is sensation? First, we must define sense. Sense is the ability to perceive stimuli. Sensation is the process initiated by stimulating sensory receptors, conscious awareness of stimuli received by sensory neurons. We have sensory receptors that are special nerve endings that are specialized cells capable of responding to stimuli by developing action potentials. Okay. We have different types of senses. First, we have our general senses in which they are distributed over a large part of the body. This includes the following senses of touch, pressure, pain, temperature, vibration, each, and proprioception proprioception, which is the sense of movement and position of the body and limbs. It is divided into two groups, the somatic and the visceral senses. When we say somatic, it provides sensory information about the body and the environment. When we say visceral, it, sens uh, it provides information about the various internal organs, primarily involving pain and pressure. So to easily distinguish between them, somatic is for outside the body, while visceral is for inside the body. We also have our special senses, our smell, taste, sight, hearing, and of balance. We have different types of receptors. First, we have our mechanoreceptors, which responds to mechanical stimuli, like bending or stretching of the receptors. A good example of this is in your stomach. Okay, the, When the mechanoreceptors in your stomach detects that there is a stretching of the stomach walls, it will send the signal to your brain that you are starting to fill up your stomach. Next, you have your chemoreceptors, which respond to your chemicals, or as uh, your chemicals such as odor molecules. So these receptors are specialized to detect different chemicals. Next, you have your photoreceptors, which respond to light, thermoreceptors, which respond to temperature, and nociceptors, which respond to stimuli that result in the stimulation of, or in the sensation of pain. Next, we have different types of touch receptors. We have Merkel discs. These are superficial nerve endings involved in detecting light and light touch and superficial pressure. We also have our hair follicle receptors. These are associated with hairs and also involved in detecting light touch. Next, we have the series of corpuscles that are in descending order <clears throat> so we have our meissner corpuscles these are receptors for fine discriminative touch located just deep the epidermis very specific in localizing tactile sensations next we have our ruffini corpuscles these are deeper tactile receptors they play an important role in detecting continuous pressure in the skin and finally the deepest one we have our pacinian corpuscles these are the deepest receptors associated with tendons and joints, relay information concerning deep pressure, vibration, and position, which is our prior proprioception. Okay, so here on your screen you can see the depth and different corpuscles present in your skin. Next, we are uh, we're going to talk about pain. So, what is pain? Pain is characterized by a group of unpleasant per perceptual and emotional experiences. We have two types of pain sensation. We have localized, sharp prickling or cutting pain resulting from rapidly conducted action potentials. We also have our diffuse, burning or aching pain resulting from action potentials that are propagated more slowly. Okay, so I think you have already... Uh, experience both types of pain first is the pain you will get from a rapid sources of trauma the other one is from inflammation or from diffused pain okay we have different methods of pain control we have local anesthesia and general anesthesia so local anesthesia is a type of pharmacotherapy in which you're going to administer a local anesthetic near the site of the pain. Okay, examples of this is your lidocaine, your emlacrim, and your prilocaine. Okay, 
what they do is they block pain by blocking the action potentials from transmitting from one nerve to another. Okay? It's not only pain that is removed, also sensation. That is why local anesthesia will result to numbness together with loss of sensation. Next, you have your general anesthesia, which produces loss of consciousness. If you're not conscious, you cannot feel pain. General anesthesia is called general because the whole body is put into a state of anesthesia. Next, you have our referred pain. So what is referred pain? Uh, referred pain is a type of pain in which your internal organs are damaged or there is something wrong with your internal organs such as trauma or inflammation. It occurs because there is no neuron uh, pain receptors on your internal organs. That is why it tends to radiate out from the deeper visceral area to where there are pain uh, receptors. A good example is if you have a heart attack, look at the orange portion on your screen. The pain will tend to radiate to the shoulder and left arm. That is why one sign of heart attack is numbness on the left, uh, radiating pain from the left side of the body. Next, we have our olfaction or our smelling. It is a sense of smell. It occurs in response to airborne molecules called odorants. Receptors are located in nasal cavities in the heart palate. There are at least 400 functional olfactory receptors in humans. There are multiple combinations of odorants and receptors that detect at least 10,000 different smells. Olfactory range and sensitivity is greater in some animals due to them having a larger olfactory uh, organ and more sensitive olfactory receptors. So here highlighted on the screen are the different nerves connected to your olfaction. So how does olfaction work? So our nasal cavity contains a thin film of mucus where all the odors are dissolved. So odors are present in the ga in gaseous phase and when it sticks to your mucus, it is detected. Olfactory neurons are located in the mucus. Dendrites of olfactory neurons are enlarged and contain cilia. Dendrites then pick up the odor, depolarize, and carry the odor to axons in the olfactory bulb, particularly your cranial nerve 1. Frontal and temporal lobes process the odor. So we have the neuronal pathways for olfaction. Axons of the different olfactory neurons form the olfactory nerves which enter to the olfactory bulb. Olfactory tracts carry action potentials from the olfactory bulbs to the olfactory complex of the brain. Within the olfactory bulb and olfactory complex are feedback loops that tend to inhibit transmission of ans of action potentials resulting from prolonged exposure to a given odorant. This feedback plus a temporary decreased sensitivity at the level of the receptors is, results in adaptation to a given odor. That is why when you spray your perfume, you tend to smell it less after a few minutes. It's because the olfactory senses tend to stop smelling repeated odors for a short period of time. Okay, so this is how the interconnected neurons work. These are the uh, important parts of olfaction, particularly your olfactory bulb on the left and the nerves that carry it to your temper to your lobes. Next, we have our closely related sense, which is our taste. We have different structures, but the most important one is your taste buds, sensory structures that detect taste stimuli. These are oval structures located on the papillae of the tongue throughout the other areas of the mouth, the pharynx, and on the palate, the roof of the tongue, and the epiglottis. Inside each taste bud are at least 40 taste cells. Each taste cell contains hair-like processes called your taste hairs that extend into taste pores. These are tiny openings in the surrounding stratified epithelium. 
receptors on the hair detect dissolved substances. So this is the anatomy of your mouth. And your taste buds are actually found on the surface of your tongue. So this is your tongue. And this is the major unit of taste, your taste buds. These are oval-like structures highlighted in blue. Each oval-like taste bud contains taste cells and supporting cells. So how does taste work? Taste buds pick up the taste and send it to taste bud, uh, taste cells. The taste cells send the taste to taste hairs. And the taste hairs contain receptor that initiate an action potential which is carried to your parietal lobe of the brain. The brain processes the taste afterwards. You have different types of taste sensations. We have sweet, sour, salty, and bitter. And we have uh, the latest one which is your umami or your savory taste. Certain taste buds are more sensitive to certain tastes, and taste is also linked to smell. Likewise, if you have a cold or a cough, and you have blocked passages in your nasal canal, you tend to taste less. So we have the neuronal pathways for taste. Taste sensations are carried by three cranial nerves. The facial nerve 7 carries taste from the anterior two-thirds of the tongue, and the gloss Glossopharyngeal nerve 9 carries the taste from the posterior one-third of the tongue. The vagus nerve carries the taste from the root of the tongue. So you have three nerves, cranial nerves, that carry your neuronal signal for taste. Axons from these three cranial nerves synapse in the gustatory portion of the brainstem nuclei. Axons in the neurons in the brainstem nuclei synapse to the, in the thalamus. And axons from the neurons in the thalamus project the taste area in the insula of the cerebrum. Okay, so these are the main connections for your cranial nerves. Okay, next we have our vision. So the visual system includes the eyes accessory structures, and sensory neurons. The eyes are housed within bony cavities called your orbits. Action potentials convey visual information from the eyes to the brain. So this is your uh, primary uh, organ of sight, which is your eyes. So we highlighted in blue is your iris and your pupil. And these are the different orbital bones that house the eye. The highlighted in purple are the different muscles that support and move your eye. The highlighted is the different parts of the eye. And this is your eyelids, the muscles involved in moving your eyelids. Okay. So these are the different parts of the eye. So on the left, you have your anterior cavity and posterior cavity. You have your posterior chamber and, and anterior chamber. You have your sclera, which is the white part of your eye. The cornea that covers most of the eye from the outside. You have your corneoscleral junction. And you have your retina on the back. Okay, so you also have your ciliary bodies here, your iris, your lens, the optic nerve which connects all the data from your eyes to your brain, the optic disc, your muscle that controls the upper eyelid, and your eyelids. Okay, okay so these are the components of the eyes. These are the optical components. When we say optical components, these are the portions responsible for sensing vision. Okay, so let's start first with the accessory structures of the eyes. First, we have the eyebrows. These protect the eyes by preventing perspiration from running down the forehead into the eyes, causing irritation. They also help shade the eyes from direct sunlight. Next, you have your eyelids. 
These protect the eyes from foreign objects and protect the eye by closing and opening quite rapidly. This is responsible for your blink reflex. Blinking, which normally keeps your eyes lubricated, occurs naturally at least 20 times per minute and helps protect the eye by lubricating it and protecting the eye from abrasion. Okay, so a thin transparent mucous membrane covering the interior surface of the eyelids and the anterior surface of the eye. Secretions from the conjunctiva help lubricate the surface of the eye and conjunctivitis is the inflammation of the conjunctiva. So this is your pink eye or your sore eyes in the Philippines. Gonococcal ophthalmia na neonatorium is the most severe form of conjunctivitis in the next slide. So this is your conjunctivitis. This and this one okay so this uh this is due to gonorrhea it can be passed from mother to child once the child exits the birth canal so the virus uh, so the bacteria is present there and infects the eyes however this can be easily remedied by simply dropping silver nitrate ophthalmic solutions on the eye after birth to prevent this complication okay so these are the eyes and its accessory organs. Next, we have our lacrimal apparatus. This consists of the lacrimal gland and the system of ducts. So your lacrimal gland lies superior and lateral to each eye. Exocrine tear glands producing lacrimal fluid, which is your tears, travel to your lacrimal canaliculi, to your lacrimal sac, and your nasal lacrimal duct. Okay, as you can see, the tears flow down towards your face and finally it exits to your nasolacrimal duct that is why every time you're going to cry in anatomy and physiology expect that tears will reach your nose and when it reaches your nose it will combine with your mucus in your nose causing a big mess so your lacrimal canaliculi are small ducts that collect excess tears in the medial angle of the eyes. The lacrimal sac is an enlargement of the nasolacrimal duct which opens to the nasal cavity. Tears lubricate and cleanse the eye. They also have special enzymes that, com com that helps combat eye infections. Next you have your tarsal and meibonial gland. Sebaceous glands embedded in the tarsal plate of each eyelid makes a lubricant called sebum, which is discharged to tiny openings in the edges of the eyelids. So you excrete small amounts of oil. So you have your sty and your chalazion. So a sty is the inflamed swelling of an edge of an eyelid, often caused by bacterial infections. It develops from an eyelash follicle or an eyelid oil gland that becomes clogged with excess oil, debris, or bacteria. It is an infection of the tarsal gland. Chalazion are characteristically hard and painless lid nodules. So to differentiate them, it is on their sensation. Slowly enlarging eyelid nodules formed by inflammation and obstruction of sebaceous glands. To easily distinguish them from one another, the sty is usually found on the edges while chalazions are not. So this is your sty. And your chalazion is found not near the edges. Okay. And to easily distinguish styes, styes usually have a head of full of pus. Next we have our extrinsic eye muscles. So you have your superior oblique muscles here, your superior rectus, your lateral rectus, and your inferior oblique and your inferior rectus. So these are the extrinsic eye muscles. Highlighted on, on purple are the muscles again. So each eye muscle has a specific cranial nerve innervating it. So one and six, I mean one and six have different cranial nerves aside from the ones in the middle. So the lateral rectus is managed by your cranial nerve six while your superior oblique is managed by your number four. And each function of each eye muscle is on the rightmost column. 
Let's move on to the anatomy of the eye. So your eyeball is a slow, flu hollow, fluid-filled sphere. The wall of the eye is composed of three tissue layers called your tunics. You have your fibrous tunics, which is the outermost, your vascular tunic, which is your middle, and your innermost, which is your nervous tunic. Okay, so your anterior and posterior cavities are divided as follows. Behind the eye, <coughs> behind this part here is your posterior cavity, and after that part is your anterior cavity. And to be more specific, you also have different compartments on your anterior cavity. So how you have your posterior cavity and your anterior cavity. I mean, posterior compartment and anterior compartment. <clears throat> so these are different angles on which how you can see the different parts of the eyeball. So fibrous tunic is the outermost most protective layer composed of dense connective tissue. It consists of the sclera, which is a firm white connective tissue layer of the posterior 5 6 of the fibrous tunic. It helps maintain the eye shape, shape, protects internal structures, and provides attachment sites for extrinsic eye muscles. Its small portion can be seen as the white of the eye. So if you look into the eyes, the white most portion is your sclera. The cornea is the one which is colored. It is a transparent anterior sixth of the eye, structure that which covers the iris and the pupil. It permits light to enter binds or refracts the entering light. So the sclera surrounds the eye and usually is opaque so it does not let light through. Well your cornea is the transparent portion of the eye which lets light through. So your vascular tunic contains most of the blood vessels of the eye hence the name vascular. You have your choroid, which is the posterior portion of the vascular tunic associated with the sclera. It is a very thin structure consisting of a vascular network and many melanin-containing pigment cells, contain, causing it to appear black. The black color absorbs light so that it is not reflected inside the eye. Its primary role is to deliver oxygen and nutrients to your retina. Next, you have your ciliary bodies. This contains ciliary muscles that change the diameter of the lens near and distant vision. And the lens is a flexible, biconvex, transparent disc that refracts or bends light. These are held in place by the suspensor suspensory ligaments, which are attached to the smooth muscles of the ciliary body. The iris is the colored part of the eye. It is con contractile in nature and consists mainly of smooth muscles surrounding an opening called the pupil. This regulates the diameter of the pupil, and the pupil is the central part of the iris. This controls the uh, amount of light entering the eye through its diameter. As light intensity increases or it becomes brighter, the pupil constricts to let less light in. As light intensity becomes dimmer or, or lesser, the pupil dilates to let more light in. Okay, So this is your iris, your ciliary body, and choroid coat. The iris is the colored portion of your eye, the iris and the pupil relative to each other, the different parts, again, the lens, and this is how your muscles in your iris move. So your circular smooth muscles causes your pupil, I mean your iris, to, con to contract, constrict, to let less light in. And your radial muscles cause your iris to dilate, to let more light in. Okay, so this is a representation of the muscles and in your lens. Okay, so you have finally the nervous and sensory tunic. This is the innermost tunic that contains neurons sensitive to light. First, you have your retina. Your retina covers the posterior 5 6 of the eye and is composed of two layers, an outer pigmented retina and an inner sensory retina. The main job of your pigmented retina keeps light from reflecting back into the eye, so it 
prevents bouncing of light. And your sensory retina, which contains your photoreceptor cells, called lights, uh, called rods and cones, which respond to lights, also con contains numerous interneurons. So let's differentiate rods and cones. Rods are very sensitive to light. They can function in dim light but do not provide color vision. These are responsible for vision in low illumination, particularly during night vision. Cones require much more light but they need but they are useful for color vision. There are three types of cones, each sensitive to a different color, your RGB, your red, blue, and green. Okay, so this is your innermost tunic, your retina, your optic disc, and your vitreous humor. So these are the ophthalmoscopic photographs from the anterior portion. This will be discussed later on what is being highlighted. You have your neural components, which is primarily your retina, your optic disc, which contains your photoreceptors, and your optic nerve, which links it to your brain. Okay, so you have your optic nerve highlighted in yellow. And you also have your short ciliary neurons that can, train, that can also pass through information. So this is the structure of a rod. And this is the structure of a cone. So this is a histologic view of the nerves in your eyes. This is a electrode microscope view of rods and cones. As you can see, the cones are much larger than the rods. Okay, so rhodopsin is a photosensitive pigment in rod cells. These are composed of protein opsin and a yellow pigment retinol that contains vitamin A. So how does light affect rhodopsin? Light strikes the rod cell, the retinol changes its shape, the opsin changes its shape. Changing the rhodopsin shape stimulates response in the rod cell which results in vision. Retinol completely detaches from opsin. ATP is required to reattach retinol to opsin and, ret and return rhodopsin to its original shape. So this is the diagram again, which is a cycle. So rhodopsin is regenerated. Okay. Next we have our night blindness. It is characterized by difficulty seeing in dim light. Can also result from retinal detachment, which is the separation of sensory retina from the pigmented retina. Retinal detachment affects the periphery of the retina more than the center of the retina where the cones are located. Since the rods are more sensitive than cones to light, retinal detachment affects vision in low light and to a greater extent than vision in bright light. Rod and cone cells synapse with bipolar cells of the sensory retina. These and the horizontal cells of the retina modify the output of the rod and cone cells. Bipolar and horizontal cells synapse with the ganglion cells whose axons converge at the posterior of the eye to form at the optic nerve. So this is the connection between your choroid to the fibers in your optic nerve. So this is how your action potential propagates to your brain. So these are parts of your cornea. Macula lutea is the yellow spot near the center of the posterior retina. It contains a small central pit called your fovea centralis. Your fovea centralis contains only cone cells and this is the region with the greatest ability to discriminate fine images. The image, the area of sharpest vision. And you have the, uh, the most uh, far back portion, which is your optic disc or your blind spot. This is a white spot medial to the macula, the area where the optic nerves exits the eye and the blood vessels enter. This contains no photoreceptor cells and does not respond to light. Okay, so here on the screen, you can see the different parts which are discussed earlier.
You have your optic disc, your macula, and the middle of the macula is your fovea centralis. Now let's talk about the different chambers of the eye. First, you have your anterior chamber. It is located between the cornea and the lens. Filled with aqueous humor or your watery fluid. Okay, so we can easily remember aqueous means water. The aqueous humor helps maintain pressure within the eye, refracts light, and provides nutrients to the inner surface of the eye. Its presence keeps the eye inflated, so it helps the shape of the eye. If the flow from the eye through the venous ring is blocked, the pressure in the eye builds up, resulting in a condition called glaucoma. Glaucoma is the excessive pressure buildup in the aqueous humor. It may destroy a retina or optic nerves, resulting in blindness. Next, you have your posterior chamber. It is located behind the anterior chamber. It also filled with aqueous humor. Next, you have your vitreous humor. It is filled with vitreous humor, a transparent jelly-like substance. It is more viscous than your aqueous humor. It helps maintain pressure within the eye, holds the lens and retina in place, and reflects light. This does not circulate, so it is stuck inside the vitreous chamber. The main functions of the eye is to reflect, refract light, which is the bending of light, light passing through a lens concave, surface diverges, and the light passing through a lens's convex surface converges. The focal point is where the crossing point where the light rays converge, occurs anterior to the retina, and the tiny image that is focused on the retina is actually inverted compared to the actual object. Converging light rays cross at the focal point and are said to be focused. So we, the eye has the ability to accommodate. The ability to adjust focusing apparatus to account for changes in distance from the viewed object. So in essence, you can zoom in and zoom out, but you can only focus on one object at a time. In accommodation for near vision, the ciliary muscle contracts, causing increased rounding of the lens, and the pupil contracts, and the optic axis converge. These actions constitute the accommodation reflex. The ability of the eye to accommodate decreases with age. Okay. So this is how your muscles in the eye uh, move the lens so that it can focus on objects. So the neuronal pathway for vision is that axons pass through the optic nerves to the optic chasm where some cross. Axons from the nasal retina cross and those from the temporal retina do not. Optic tracts from the chiasm lead to the thalamus. Optic radiations extend from the thalamus to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So this is a cross-cut section to see clearly the connection between your optic nerve, your optic chiasm, and your optic tracts. So we have several eye defects. Myopia, is also known as your nearsightedness, is the ability to see close but not distant objects. It is caused when refractive power of the cornea and the lens is too great relative to the length of the eye. So that is me. Next, we have our hyperopia or farsightedness. The ability to see distant objects but not close objects caused when the cornea is too flat or lens has too little refractive power relative to the length of the eye. You also have your presbyopia, which is the decrease in near vision due to re re reduced flexibility of the lens and reduction in accommodation. It is a normal part of aging as the lens becomes less elastic. Okay. Mm. You also have your astigmatism. It is uh, the irregular curvature of the lens, so the image is not sharply focused. Glasses or contacts may be required to correct this one. And color blindness is complete or partial absence of the perception of one or more colors. It is the absence of deficient cones. And most forms are more frequent in males. Since male... The... 
gene for color blindness is with males. Okay, so this is your Ishihara test. If you cannot see the number 74 or 42, you might be colorblind. So consult your uh, doctor immediately. This is actually given to our friends back in Lima. So actually, hindi nyo sila kilala kasi hindi kayo napasok. So if ever you're going to shift towards marine transportation, this is a mandatory test for all mariners since failure to detect colors can lead to misinterpretations of signals on the boats. Another eye defect is your strabismus. When one or both eyes are misdirected, banlag, one can, it, this can result from weak eye muscles. Diplopia is double vision. And glaucoma is discussed earlier, which is resulting from the increased pressure in the eye. And finally, our final sense for this lecture is our hearing, pandinig. So we have different parts of the ear. First, you have your external ear. Extends from the outside to your eardrum. So hanggang eardrum is your <coughs> external ear. The oracle, or the pina, is the fleshy part of the external ear on the outside of the head. Acts as a radiator in thermal reg regulation. That is why if you're exposed to cold temperatures, your, your ears tend to redden up. Your EAM, or your external auditory meatus, is a passageway that leads to the eardrums, a tube-like passage contain carrying airborne sound waves farther into the ear apparatus, lined with hairs and ceruminous glands which produce cerumen, a modified sebum commonly called earwax. The hairs in the cerumen prevent foreign objects from reaching the delicate tympanic membrane. So again, advice, do not clean your ears too much since if you do not have cerumen in your ear canals, it can actually cause infections. Next, you have your external, uh, continuing our external ear, you have your tympanic membrane or your eardrum. This is a thin membrane that separates the external ear from the middle ear, covers the end of the external auditory meatus to form a boundary with the middle ear. It vibrates when struck with airborne, airborne sound waves, carrying the sound energy into the middle ear. Okay, so you have your auricle, which is the outermost portion, your in ex external auditory canal, which is the middlemost, and the last part, which is your tympanic membrane or your eardrum. Okay, so this is the otoscopic photograph of your tympanic membrane. It's a very, it's a very thin layer. That is why it needs to be protected. Okay, so this is your tympanic membrane with otitis media. So otitis media is the bacterial infection of the middle part of your ears. E. So you can actually see the blood. Okay, so next you have your middle ear. Contains three auditory ossicles. So ossicles are small, uh, uh, small parts. The malleus, the incus, and the stapes. The malleus, also called your hammer, is a tiny club-shaped bone attached to the eardrum, vibrates when sound waves pass through it from the eardrum. Incus, which is your anvil, is the bone that connects the malleus to the stapes. It vibrates when it receives energy from the malleus. Stapes, or your stirrup, is the ossicle joined in the incus in which it forms to receive vibrations. So the malleus is the first one to receive the energy. Next is your incus, then your staples or your stirrups. So you have your auditory tube or your estrusian tube. It is a collapsible tube running between the middle ear and the pharynx. It enables air pressure to be equalized between the outside air and the middle ear cavities. So you can hear, uh, you can feel this working. 
if ever you experience uh, riding on an airplane or going down under the ocean. The oval window is an oval opening at the head of the cochlea, connecting the middle and the inner ear, through which sound vibrations of the steps are transmitted. The round window, an opening of the medial wall of the middle ear that leads to the cochlea and is covered by a secondary tympanic membrane, also called fenestra of the cochlea. Okay, so you have your auditory tube here. This is where the equalization occurs. You have your round window and you have your oval window over here. <clears throat> Next, you have your inner, your inner ear. This has three parts, the semicircular canals, the vestibule, and the cochlea. You also have your bony labyrinth or osseous labyrinth, the cavity in the petrous portion of the temporal lobe that contains the membranous labyrinth of the inner ear. Divided into two inner ear regions, the cochlea, the vestibule, and the semicircular canals. So your cochlea is involved in hearing, your vestibule, and your semicircular canals are primarily involved in balance. The membranous labyrinth, filled with the endolymph and surrounded by the perilymph, includes the cochlear duct, urticle, saccule, and semicircular ducts. Okay, so you have your semicircular ducts, the cochlea, which looks like a snail, the urticle, utricle, and your vestibular cochlear nerve. Okay, so endolymph is the clear fluid in the membranous labyrinth. Perilymph is the fluid between the membranous and bony labyrinths. Your cochlea is a long passage canal shaped like a snail's shell. It is divided into com three components by the vestibular and basilar membranes. It has three channels, the scala vestibuli, the scala tympani, and the cochlear duct. So your scala vestibuli extends from the oval window to the apex of the cochlea. It is primarily filled with perilymph. Your scala tympani extends in parallel with the scala vestibuli from the apex back to the round window. It is filled with perilymph. And your cochlear duct formed by the space between the vestibular membrane and the basilar membrane. <clears throat> it is filled with your endolymph. Okay, so this is the uh, cross-section of your cochlea. Okay. Next, you have your spiral organ or organ of CAR-T. This is a specialized structure inside the cochlear drop. It contains specialized sensory cells called hair cells, which have hair-like microvilli, often called as stereocilia. The tectural membrane is a, a cellular gelatinous shelf in which hair tips are embedded. It vibrates against hair cells. And hair cells are attached to sensory neurons that, when bent, produce an action potential. Okay, so this is the zoom-in version of the different parts of your cochlea. Okay, now let's talk about the effect of sound waves on the cochlear structures. Sound waves are funneled through the auricle down the external auditory canal, causing the tympanic membrane to vibrate. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the malleus, incus, and the stapes to vibrate. The base of the stapes vibrates in the oval window, and the vibration of the base of the stapes causes the perilymph in the scala vestibuli to vibrate. Vibration of the perilymph causes vestibular membrane to vibrate, which causes vibrations in the endolymph, and the vibration of the endolymph causes displacement of the basilar membranes. Short waves cause displacement of the basilar membranes near the oval window, and longer waves cause displacement of the basilar membranes farther from the oval window. Movement of the basilar membrane is detected in the hair cells of the spiral organ, which are attached to the basilar membrane. Vibrations of the perilymph in the scala vestibuli and the basilar membranes are transferred to the perilymph of the scala tympani. Vibrations in the perilymph of the scala tympani are transferred to the round window where they are dampened. So it ends there.
Okay, so this is an easier diagram for you to know how the vibrations occur. Okay, so first it is received by your tympanic membrane, moves towards the three small bones in which it projects the sound into the liquid layer or the liquid portion. It bounces off and finally it will exit through the oval win the round window. So if this one could play, this would be a good example. Okay. <coughs> Hearing impairment categories. First we have our conduction deafness. This results from mechanical deficiencies like destruction of the ligament that holds the malleus and incus together. Sensorineural hearing loss caused by deficiencies in the spiral organ or nerves. Loud sounds can uh, damage the delicate microvilli of the hair cells, leading to destruction of the spiral organ. So, neuronal pathways for hearing. From the vestibular cochlear nerve, action potentials travel to the cochlear nucleus and to the cerebral cortex. So, let's talk about balance. So we have two types of balance, particularly our equilibrium. So we have our static, which is associated with the vestibule, evaluates position of the head relative to gravity. And you have your dynamic equilibrium, which is associated with the semicircular canals, evaluates change in the direction and the rate of head movements. Okay. You also have the different parts related to balance. You have your vestibule, which is divided into two chambers. That were the utricle and the saccule. You also have your maculae, which is a specialized patch of epithelium in the utricle and saccule, surrounded by the endolymph. This contains also your hair cells for hearing. Otholiths are gelatinous masses containing particles of calcium carbonate, and this moves in response to gravity, bending the hair cell, microvilli, and imitating action potentials in the associated neurons. Okay. So this is an example of how the fluid in your head measures your balance. So once your head moves, these substances also move and they send action potentials to let the brain know what orientation the head is in. Next, you have your semicircular canals. These are involved with dynamic equilibrium. These detect movements in essentially any direction. The base is expanded into the ampulla. Next, you have your crystal polaris, which is the crest of tissue with each, within each ampulla. This is a patch of sensory hair cells covered with a gelatinous mass called your cupula. The cupula functions as a float that is displaced by the endolymph movement within the semicircular canals like this one. Okay, so for the neuronal pathways of balance, actions in the vestibular portion of the vestibular cochlear nerve project to the vestibular nucleus and onto the cerebral cortex. Right here, it transmits toward your vestibular cochlear nerve. We have different types of ear disorders. First, you have your tinnitus, so the phantom sound sensations such as ringing in the ears. So if you're in a totally silent room, you may uh, hear a pinging noise. This is your tinnitus. Middle ear infection. Symptoms are low-grade fever, lethargy, irritability, and pulling at the ear. For babies, for babies and children. So if hinahatak nila yung ears nila, this can... Uh, be a sign for middle ear infection. This is common in children. Inner ear infection can decrease detection of sound and maintenance of balance. May be, co may be caused by chronic middle ear infections if left untreated. Motion sickness. So nausea and weakness caused from when information from the brain and from the semicircular canals conflicts with the information from the eyes and position sensors in the back and the lower limbs. So, pag hindi nagkakatagpo-tagpo ang inyong tenga at ibang part ng inyong katawan, it leads to motion sickness. Usually, this occurs if uh, the data from your ears tend to lag a little bit. 
You also have your Meniere disease, which is vertigo, hearing loss, tinnitus, and the feeling of fullness in the affected ear. Most common disease involving dizziness from the inner ear. Uh, cause unknown, but may be due to a fluid abnormality in the ears. And finally, we have our effects of aging and the senses. Elderly people experience a general decline in general senses, such as taste, vision, hearing, and balance. This may be due to the sensory organs wearing out. And this is a natural process. So thank you for listening. This has been the whole lecture for our senses.